I think that the police have been on strike in San Francisco. I think if you look at the number of moving violations that have been you know, given to cars, you see in COVID, it just cratered to zero and it has not gotten off of zero yet. California is a class society based on land, which is why Henry George was here. He was a Californian, you know? The land, most landed oriented state is, is California for sure. Absolutely. That whole area between the official boundaries of San Francisco and the airport, that is the future of San Francisco. And then in the East Bay, you'll have just any, any East Bay community has the opportunity for growth. Uh, so Grow SF is trying to succeed where the Yimbies failed because what Grow SF realized is that the Yimbies were getting voted down by Asian voters who were scared of crime. Hmm. So focus on what the voters care about rather than what you... Interesting. So it's almost as if democracy is a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a quick uh, zoom out to first um, say, Noah, welcome back to, to Moment of Zen. Uh, it's great to, great to have you. Thanks. Wait, where's, uh, where's um, AGM? Is he, is he still a part of this? AGM is a part of this, but he's the Dennis Rodman of this podcast. And, you know, sometimes he shows, sometimes he shows late, um, but he's so special. We kind of just let him do what he needs to do. <laughs> if uh, if people haven't listened to episode nine of Moment of Zen, um, or followed your work previously. Uh, Noah is a very prominent uh, economist, uh, writer, has a great substack called No Opinion, and has recently joined the Turpentine Media Network uh, with uh, with podcast with me called Econ 102. Uh, so stoked we're, we're doing that together too, No. Yeah, I'm getting really good feedback about Econ 102. People are liking it. Yeah. My favorite new podcast, and I don't actually <laughs> listen to that many podcasts. So. Yeah. Wow. Uh, excellent. I'm on. Um, well, Noah, you know, we just recorded with Mark Andreessen the other day. And one thing I thought we would um, start with perhaps is how do you think about the differences between kind of the abundance agenda, you know, Ezra Klein, you, Derek Thompson, et cetera, and Mark Andreessen's kind of abundance time to build. There's obviously a lot of overlap there. Where is the difference? Uh, I, I don't know, but um, I have this general principle that uh, if we're going to, you know, actually build stuff in America, we need both the right and left competing to offer visions that differ somewhat uh but not in their basic idea of let's build some stuff um just arguing over the particulars of what we should actually build and uh, and i think that the way that we're going to onboard conservatives to this i think uh, one way we're going to do that is defense contracting is is you know through through military spending and i think that that's what Catherine boyle has been focusing on a lot in um you know at the american dynamism fund uh, you know, it's not just defense contractors, but that's a, a big part of it. And I think that that's re that's going to be really good, first of all, because obviously we need to disrupt the sort of hegemony of the five big prime contractors. We all know that story. But then um, but also just because, you know, back in the back in the 80s, there, you know, Reagan's military buildup actually built a lot of important stuff in science and technology and pushed our science and technology forward a lot. In addition to, you know, providing jobs for everybody in Southern California and all that stuff that today would be the kind of thing you might think uh, uh, like a progressive, quote unquote, would want. Um, you know, let's let's do industrial policy and blah, blah. But Reagan did it with the defense buildup. And, um, and that's sort of a, a path forward for something that's not just tax cuts on the on the right. You know, like something besides like, let's cut taxes even more, which no one really wants to do. But they can't think of anything else to do. They need, you know. The, the, the right is casting around for kind of a new economic policy paradigm. And I think that, you know, defense contracting is like a start for how to start working their way back toward, uh, you know, um, a conservatism that builds. So I think that's my my general thought about that. Mark was effectively saying that. So we were talking about sort of the the, the pushback within the the uh, Democratic Party in, in California from from the, these folks who are saying, hey, um, you know, we want a leftism that, that builds. But Mark was saying that because there's only one party state effectively, um, you know, the, the, there's no competition. And he was effectively implying that those people would be more effective in pushing back against the far sort of wings of that party if they came from the other party and introduced kind of m more structural competition. Are you sympathetic with that? Right. Yeah. The California GOP sort of shot itself in the head in the 90s and never recovered. Um, and this is a big problem for California because it means that if you want to do anything that's not, uh, you know, like if you if you want to do anything that 
Republicans would normally do. Uh, you have to be part of the Democratic Party in California, uh, you know, which which, you know, and what, what you see, you know, you what most people frame this as is like California, you know, Democrats being neoliberals and actually being Republicans in disguise, blah, blah, blah. But what it actually means is you have a lot of these, you know, self-described leftists and socialists preventing the building of any housing and trying to sort of save the suburbs and preserve the suburbs under the guise of some made up pseudo Marxist mumbo jumbo. What they actually are is just like suburban landlords and homeowners who want to preserve their, their, you know, little, uh, you know, thief. And so basically those people would be Republicans. Um, and now they're pretending to be like actual communists uh, like Dean Preston, you know, he's um, Dean Preston is a natural Republican. He's like the you, you can you can just take him and set him down in the middle of like 19, like 75. And he's like the member of the Lions Club, you know, talking about how like uh, apartment buildings are bad. And, you know, we in some like medium sized town out in the Midwest, like he's that guy. But then in, in California, he's a progressive socialist, you know, whatnot. And um, it's. It's those people that the California GOP has failed. Those, you know, those are the people who should be Republicans. But in general, um, the California GOP failing is a big deal. And um, and it goes back to this freak out in the 1990s over Hispanic immigration. I'm from Texas and Texas takes a very, very different uh, attitude toward Hispanic immigration. Um, Texans are not open borders people anymore. We used to be. Um, we, uh, Texans, Texans got the big carve out in the 1924 immigration restriction. Everyone's like, we banned immigration for a generation. Well, yes, except from Mexico, because the Texans wanted the Mexicans to come in. Uh, Texas has never really viewed itself as particularly separate from Mexico, where it originally, you know, the, if America has a special relationship with Britain, Texas has a special relationship with Mexico, which we used to be a part of. And in fact, it was, um, you know, people think it was the white settlers who rebelled against the Mexican government in Santa Ana. No, it was the Tejanos, the, the Mexican Texans of San Antonio who rebelled against Mexico City control and just recruited some of these white ranchers to help them. Um, and that was how it started. But, but Texas has always basically taken this different view of not seeing Mexicans as the other. And California, in California, the GOP somehow fell into that trap with Pete Wilson and with that whole era. And with, you know, there, were, there was this big SoCal freakout, you know, um, Stephen Miller, this guy who, who ran immigration policy for the Trump administration, he came out of SoCal in the 80s, right? And, um, and a lot of these guys, you know, a lot of the Claremont guys came out of this SoCal sort of like anti-immigrant freakout uh, from, from I, really the 90s, I guess, 80s, but really the 90s. And... Um, and then and then there was there was a big deal like, uh, you know, and, and California went in hard for, you know, the, the GOP really went hard for like restricting immigration and, and stripping welfare services from from any immigrant and blah, blah. Um, and uh, and that damaged them. That really damaged them because they they have not been able to recruit Mexican Californians, Hispanic Californians uh, or Latinos, as Californians call them, uh, to the cause to the republican party they haven't been able to do it and until they do it they're sunk because this is a plurality hispanic state yeah and and if you actually look you know obviously in florida and texas the latino population is actually moving to the right right it's like gotten progressively more republican in, in the national elections but that has not been the case i think to the same degree as in california right right not at all and um and you've even seen uh hispanics moving to the right in nevada and colorado in the like mountain interior sort of west um just not in california in blue states hispanics are very like you know lefty and so that yeah so do the gary tans of the world who we really you know admire their work do, do they have a chance of taking over the 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 sort of the left within California and and making a major influence, or would they be better off competing um, from the from the from the right? And I mean, I mean, sort of not ideologically. I just mean structurally. Well, okay. So Gary Tan is in a big city, which means he's going to have to be a Democrat no matter what. Um, Gary Tan 
is focused, I think, and you'll have to let him speak for himself here, but I think he's focused a lot on getting the votes of Asian people in the west side of the city who are concerned about crime and, and disorder. Um, and I think, you know, he, he started Grow SF to be a pro-housing uh, thing. And I think he's really had to pivot that, or him, but really Sachin Agarwal, who, who really runs Grow SF. Gary Tan is busy. Um, but, but then... Going back to the, the machine, right? Like that's an ethnic group of people. They dominate in terms of the total percentage of the city. Like I think it's the highest percentage of any big city in the country in terms of Asian American or Asian immigrant population. Right. And so if you can get that group to vote as a block in a way that is more kind of focused on, you know, crime, safety, uh, teaching algebra in the public schools in San Francisco, uh, maybe that's a state level policy, but like. I think that, that that's an actual problem. modern version of a machine, right? I agree. It absolutely is. Um, there are probably some laws that we've enacted to make it harder to make a machine. Um, but I don't know what those are. And, and um, that's why you should have Jason on. But um, but yeah, so I think that that's exactly right. But that's, that's city level. And that's a very unusual uh, situation. You have some cities that are majority Asian or plurality Asian. I don't actually know if San Francisco is plurality Asian or not. Um, I'd have to look at that. But then um, it's certainly very, very important in politics. Uh, and so that machine is really important. You could do that probably in Fremont. You could do that probably in um, like a couple other places, uh, Cupertino maybe. Um, but then, but overall at the state level, you're going to have to get Hispanics on board. And I have what I have not yet seen is much Asian Hispanic cooperation politically in California. There is very, very little dialogue or interaction between those groups. It's it's very class separated because, you know, most of the, the Latino Californians are descended from people who came to do blue collar work, agricultural work or home building or, or whatnot, uh, child care. But then um, but most Asian people in California, you know, there are some who are descended from like railroad workers, but I think most at this point are descended from skilled immigrants. And so there's a big class distinction there um and so that's been difficult to bridge uh and and so that would be important uh to to try to bridge that i i just looked up now at 34 percent 2020 census san francisco asian 40, okay 44 percent white 34 percent asian american so i mean got that's it. a that's a really high percentage it's for close yeah 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 it's not quite plurality but yeah yeah it is interesting though that la um put George Gascon, who was the former DA in SF, who then came to LA to the side, it, it does feel like it's, and this is where I live now and 10 years in San Francisco, it feels like it tacked a little bit to the center. I, probably not that much, but Karen Bass actually, in order to beat Caruso in her election, really had to push the homeless uh, issue. And, uh, you know, I'm in Venice, which was kind of like outside of Skid Row was ground zero for some pretty tough stuff during COVID. And it's significantly uh, cleaned up in terms of like people are in shelters they're you know putting them in motels or whatever but like the 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 camp city uh, you know tent cities that were in venice all during COVID are, are gone now and so mm -hmm. I, I i kind of i couldn't tell you the differences in terms of like why why that is versus you know because obviously santa monica la like is it, pretty pretty liberal even relative to you know sf it's it's i think pretty on par but um Maybe I, I couldn't tell you the, the reason L.A. It seems to be a little bit better managed than uh, San Francisco in that regard. Yeah, I, I mean, San Francisco has this notoriously crappy governing structure where uh, the um, there's a an agreement. It's not actually a written agreement. It's just a traditional agreement that each supervisor gets to uh, have veto over whatever is done in their district, which is terrible. Um, what it means. But but, you know, who's going to give it up? Who's going to give this? Who's going to be the first to give up their little fiefdom? So, so the board of supervisors has all the power in San Francisco, and it is a very fragmented board. Um, <clears throat> and so, the only way to change San Francisco politically is to elect, is to basically get a, a you know gang of of people on the board of supervisors, where you basically win a majority there. The problem is each district has very idiosyncratic politics, so you have to fight it district by district. It's not like citywide waves. Um, and there's a lot of like pork that's directed to specific districts. Um, so that's that's a dysfunctional political structure. It's always been like that, or at least since the 70s, I guess. And um, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, so L.A., I, I only learned this recently. They have a city council and the, the, the supervisor or the, the council member that represents each area. 
um parent maybe even has more control than than a soup in, in san francisco which is kind of wild they're they're, they're basically all mini mayors and oh, um, wow. they, they have a lot of direction uh in their district as to what the police enforce and so what the, the kind of scuttlebutt that you hear at a dinner party in venice is that basically tracy uh park who, who is now the the council member in charge of venice and some of the beach towns um is enforcing the kind of loitering and, and whatever's on the books in LA. And, and that's actually one of the primary reasons that the the homeless, at least tent cities that had been prevalent during COVID have been enforced. And it's because of the the ability to direct the actual police. So. Right. So about this, I just don't know how this works. And you're going to have to have Gary or Sachin on. Um, yeah. yeah, they talk about the police commission a lot. I, I think that the police have been on strike in San Francisco. I think if you look at the number of moving violations that have been you know, given to cars, you see in COVID, it just cratered to zero and it has not gotten off of zero yet. Like nobody, every, every Uber driver will tell you, you can just run red lights. You can, you know, make illegal turns. You can do whatever you want. The police will not pull you over in San Francisco. You know, Gary and, and Sachin will talk about the police commission and maybe that's important, but how, how do you get the police to actually arrest people for stuff? So that's, that's important. But also, you know, the mayor, Set, implemented this thing where it's sort of the opposite of broken windows policing, where she said, we're not going to arrest anyone for under $900 of theft. So you have people stealing stuff from stores. They go up to the video that's recording them. They show the merchandise to the video. They say, this is under $900 and then they leave. So that's I, I saw happened. some, you know, it's gotten worse in terms of the, the videos and photos that show up on San Francisco. And you never know if they're kind of doctored or made up, but the most recent one that I saw was a Walgreens where it's like literally everything, even even the like cold drink things were chained. <laughs> it's like yeah. you have to ask someone to get you anything <clears throat> in the entire store. I think that's my Walgreens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, th th there's a broader question there of like, did those Walgreens CVS is like that was a peak phenomenon. And, and the reality is like, OK, we don't need one on every corner. And, and you know, with e-commerce, like, you know, you just don't have the store, I think. A little dystopian look in, to think that you look can't. in New York City, see what's going on in New York City. Like if, if New York City has Walgreens and CVS all over the place, which yeah, I think it fair. still does. So, so it's a policy. Yeah. So so no, I'd be curious because I think you you spent a lot of time thinking about like a broader set of things. Is is there a city structure in the United States or even maybe abroad that you've come across that seems like okay, this is well run, or is it a is it a broader problem of the structural like federal law that's not aligned with city and state and and how do how do you think about that? It's just really complex because it's hard to know what to attribute things to. There's local policy, there's local culture, there's state policy, there's, you know, there's um, uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, you know, business structure, like, you know, some in, some cities have knowledge industries, others don't. It's just really hard to tell. Um, you can make guesses about what works and what doesn't. Um, Houston is a super well-run city. Uh, people complain about Houston all the time, but one thing you learn is that people complain about anything all the time. And um, and often cities that are the best run will get a lot of complaints because the but the difference is that the complaints are actually listened to and fixed, but they still get the complaints because complaining works, you know, gets things fixed. And so um, but but so people complain about Houston, but it's really well run. Um, it's a very sprawly city, but they're now densifying. So they're they're building up sort of those downtown areas and areas of dense housing while still preserving like the massive suburbs that they had. Uh, Texas has famously loose zoning laws. And, um, you know, Houston has been, uh, y y um, Houston had those massive floods, right, back in, I want to say 2018. And gigantic floods flooded much of the city, and there was no looting. Uh, you know, everybody just, like, came together and helped everybody else. Um, this is, you know, I mean, uh, ethnically, this city is not very different from, you know, like, any other big Texas city, it's quite uh, diverse, but then you didn't really see any like localized conflict and the institution, like, you know, poor people got flooded out cause they had to live in the flood. They, they live in the flood zone cause it's cheaper. Um, and that sucks. But then the, the emergency services just went and helped them and regular people just went and volunteered and like helped all the, the poor people, you know, get their stuff out. And, um, and, uh, it was very, uh, there was, there was lots of like the city really came together. Um, and so, Houston is a, is a functional city. They've, um, they've built so much housing. They completely got rid of their homeless problem by, by just like building housing. And a lot of that housing is just cheap land sprawl at the outskirts of town. You know, you build an apartment building. Um, it's not like we didn't put these people up at the four seasons. 
you know, it's not like we, we didn't build like, you know, some, some ritzy development that's like 10% poor people and 90% rich people and then subsidize the 10%, whatever inclusionary zoning does. Instead, it's just like, here's some apartments where if you're kind of poor, you can live in this apartment uh, for cheap or free. And it worked. Um, and, uh, you know, people live there and it's fine. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so Houston just built a shit ton of housing. <laughs> And, um, yeah, I mean, like, you know, you have, you do have a drug problem in Houston as you do in much of America at this time. It's not, people talk about, oh, the, all the homeless people are on drugs. Well, that's true. But then like Houston has like, I guess, even more people on drugs than, than a lot of places. It had, there's a lot of drugs in Houston and yet somehow the city functions, you know, because you actually build housing. Um, and now they're, and now they're building, you know, nice downtown stuff too. So I'd, I'd look at that. Hey everybody. If you're a business owner or founder like me, you'll want to know more about our sponsor, NetSuite. NetSuite provides financial software for all your businesses. Whether you're looking for an ERP tool or accounting software, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control you need to make better decisions faster. And for the first time in NetSuite's 25 years as the number one cloud financial system, you can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. That's no payment and no interest for six months. And you can take advantage of the special financing offered today. NetSuite is number one because they give your business everything you need in real time, all in one place to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity across every department. More than 36,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. If you've been checking out NetSuite already, then you know this deal is unprecedented. No interest, no payments. So take advantage of the special financing offer with our promo code at netsuite.com zen. That's netsuite.com zen to get the visibility and control your business needs to weather any storm netsuite.com slash zen why are they building housing and 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 we're not or, and like do you expect that to change in the next few years is anything really going to change there or do you think we're going to kind of have the same same problems and it's like a structural issue that can't really be moved that's a great question i don't know what the answer to why houston builds housing is because it sprawls because there's not much zoning and because um uh you know, there, there's so much of a driving town that, that you don't have people being like scared that building housing will mean that poor people live next to me and rob me. Um, because, you know, how are they going to get there? They'd have to drive into town. They have to drive to your neighborhood. Um, anyone who sort of wants to, to live in the suburbs to like be away from poor people kind of can and then just drive in because uh, it's so sprawly. And this is what you see in a lot of towns throughout the South. You see people. But ironically, you know, this makes the people in the burbs feel pretty safe because they, you know, because poor people aren't there. Whereas if you have like a lot of transit, transit centric cities, everybody thinks that if you, um, you know, poor people can easily get to my neighborhood through, through the bus. And then if you have, you know, if you build up dense, dense apartment buildings or whatever, um, and you know, and you build them sort of everywhere, then everyone's afraid, oh no, the poor people are going to live in this apartment building. They're going to rob me because I'll be their neighbor and they'll rob me, which is, you know, to be fair, often true. So, uh, but not, you know, not always true, like mostly not true, but then some true enough that they worry about it. Um, and so, so Houston sprawl, there's the sprawly driving centric city, uh, allows it to, to be more affordable and to, you know, gives people the space to feel like they're not, uh, you know, like they're, they're, they're sharing the city because it, the, you know, it spreads out. And, and so I think you see this, interestingly, you, this is not the form of cities that you see in Europe or in Japan that everybody loves, the train-centric, super-dense cities. But it is the form of city that you see in developing countries, like in Jakarta, you see this. Um, you see this in Bangkok. This, this is what Bangkok is like. Me- um, Mexico City is like that. Absolutely, Mexico City. Yeah. Yeah. That appears to be the city format that works, and to some degree, Los Angeles is that. It has its affordability problems, but, when you talk, but Los Angeles' sprawl allows it to to have some of this effect, I think. Um, you know, there were the, the Los Angeles was the site of the biggest riot uh, in like biggest one city riot in American history, or at least modern American history that killed more people and destroyed like more property than the entire George Floyd protests, I believe, um, in the 90s. And yet almost no one was touched by it, right? Because it was so sprawly that it was just in one little area of the city. And, um, and I think that um, that is the the destiny of American cities is this this sort of sprawl, which doesn't mean you don't have density, 
uh, because you will have areas of density, pockets of density, but you have to have areas of sprawl. If you don't have any areas of sprawl, then you're going to get vicious fights over where the apartment buildings get built because no one's going to want to build them nearby. Um, and this is what you get in San Francisco because San Francisco is this tiny little city on like at the tip of this peninsula that is already the second densest largest city, large city in America after New York City. And so there's no, there, no sprawl can be done. This, the sprawl is all in other towns. And also it's across bridges, right? In Marin or, or East Bay. The, the, the sprawl happens in the East Bay. Um, you know, you could, ha you can have some, and, and California just has much more restrictive laws that make it harder to sprawl. Uh, we used, they used to sprawl a lot. So there is some, there are many places in like Northern California that will look sprawly, but they were all built sort of before the seventies. San, San Jose being a good, like the general area around San Jose feels a lot more sprawly than it does. Marin, Marin is everything is, is in agricultural land trusts and like, you can't, you know, lift a finger without having people freak out. Right. San, California is all about control of scarce land. Texas is all about lack of land scarcity. Texas, you know, they're both these huge states. Texas is just like, go build, go build. And then, um, and te California is like, no, you can't build here because it's owned by this rich person. No, you can't build here because it's this farm. No, you can't build here because it's owned by the government. No, you can't build here because we just made a law saying you can't build here. You can't build here because it's this tiny little town that blocks people from building anything in this town. And so, like, California is, is really this land economy. You know, whoever controls the land controls everything. Texas, you have big landowners who are powerful, but they're all controlling, like, land for industry and, and agriculture you know the urban land control of urban land is not how you get rich in texas and never has been it it is interesting you you bring that up because like leland stanford obviously the legacy that that his business empire is is the union pacific like uh landlord company that basically owns a ton of land in california if you right. meet any multi-generation californian family that has any money they always it's just it's the amount of land that they control and and when I moved to L.A., I read the history book about kind of L.A. and, and the Chandler family and, and the reality you realize L.A. before Hollywood even showed up, the original business model was sell land to people in the Midwest and Iowa, like put it in newspapers, kind of just sell them on. Oh, don't get, you know, you won't have bronchitis here. Like the, the weather is really nice. And it was just originally just a, a land development city. All the money coming down from San Francisco. Right. And a little bit of oil. But but like I, I think generally la has always just been about real estate and, and selling the land right um, california is a class society based on land which is why henry george was here he was a california you know yeah it, it is interesting to think about is it's the land most landed oriented state is, is california for sure absolutely was your and, and then and then once you own the land you don't have your taxes go up so if, if anything it's like it, it's the most uh kind of like once you're in it's it's a lottery ticket right and Noah, was your earlier point that the Dean Prestons of the world, like, kind of use the the labels of progressive socialism as a way to kind of distract from, like, very Republican land um, sort of orientation or policies? Absolutely, absolutely. the The Dean Dean Preston's core constituency lives in, you know, hate, and those people were all hippies who moved to the hate who moved there because that was the center of hippiedom. Um, you know, a bunch of white boomers. And then they bought houses there because they just decided decided to settle down there. And then those houses appreciated to the millions of dollars. And if those people ever sell, they'll have millions of dollars. And that, you know, that is Dean Preston's core constituency. Do those people want apartment buildings near their houses that are their entire nest egg? No, they do not. Um, but they will come up with some progressive reason because they're a bunch of, you know, <clears throat> old white hippies in a in you know a predominantly you know massive overwhelmingly democratic state but they those are the the republicans of san francisco is the old is you know hippies who aged into home ownership and and landlording the last place we lived in san francisco we had bought a kind of like two bedroom house you're you're going to classic san francisco wedged in there neighbors on either side had owned the house for what 40 years or something we paid 10x the property tax rate for the basically the exact same house, right? Just because we we were marked to market on 2018, and they were you know whenever Prop 13 went into place. Yep. Yep. All right. And so, how do they have the constituency? Given you know, like, how do they have the numbers? Given there there aren't that many you know rich white boomers who have 
who have homes. Or, they're or not are... rich. They're 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 house rich, but they don't have that much money, and so house actually rich. they don't have a, a good option to move because they can't really go buy something on the market today, right. and they would have to pay property taxes at a much higher rate. Right. They could go rent for the rest of their life. They could just cash out completely, take millions of dollars, and then go rent for the rest of their life. Um, there have actually been some interesting, I, I want to say, I don't know if they ended up making the ballot, but some props have been trying to chip away at the, this this Prop 13 issue. So yeah. one I just still can't believe didn't pass last time was anything over what, like $5 million assessed value for commercial real estate. So like think big you know, office buildings, things that people have owned for generations, they're, they're not like a small business that's, you know, it's like a bodega that's trying to make it. It's big commercial landlords, this landed gentry in California. And this is a popular vote ballot issue, right? So it's not like most people have this. It lost. And it's just like, why, why, why are we letting these like rich commercial landlords get to pay like this, like kind of grandfather tax rate in a state that has like major budget issues, especially around underfunded pensions? And so we didn't get that passed. And then I think the other one, this may have passed, is allowing people to grandfather their property tax rate in their current house if they want to downsize and basically put the real estate in a city to a much more productive use in terms of potentially increasing the density or adding more units. They could move to somewhere maybe outside the city in, in a smaller house and then keep the property tax rate. I don't know if that actually ended up passing or ended up making on the ballot, but mm. it feels like trying to chip away at Prop 13 is a very valuable kind of upstream thing to do in terms of actually getting better land use policy in California. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. That it, prop 13, you know, is just, that is the, the ultimate kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, institutionalization of the land landed gentry regime is prop 13. No, is there a good book on prop 13? I feel like it's like such an important issue for arguably the most important state in the country has this, terrible policy that was put in place in the 70s and is just the, the downstream consequences of that have just been horrendous the book is called golden gates it's okay. by connor doherty there you go i figured you knew knew the it book. Is so the, it, it is, is it the, actually yeah. specifically about prop 13 it is about the history of the the sort of how, how california's land system got the way it is it has a large section on prop 13 but it's not only about prop 13 so but it, does it, it cover like the Hacienda system prior and like does like the full history of California land? No, so it does not cover the the Hacienda system. It co it starts in like the the um 50s and 60s. Oh, okay. In, so it's like a more modern of, approach. Yeah. yeah, and then it it covers that, it covers Prop 13 and it covers the sort of um, you know, all, basically describes how the NIMBY regime in California got put in place and how, you know, what the incentives were that made everyone want to sort of buy into this idea and um yeah, it, it's a really great introduction called Golden Gates. Okay, that that's definitely on my list because I also I'm, I'm pretty sure it was um, Jerry Brown was the original. Like he was in that was his first term when they passed it. Uh, was it? Was it? Well, because he how many times was he governor? It was like like two or three or like. Oh, you know. hold on, let me let me look that. But but what's wild is like Reagan, like people who newer to California, I don't think appreciate that Reagan was governor of California right? Yes. Like, it's like the state used to be really conservative. It was like a bunch of ex-military people coming back from the war, living in Orange County. And, and you know, and then obviously the politics dramatically shifted post 60s. So I, I, I'm, I actually don't have a good basis for California history in that in that period. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, Jerry Brown, it turns out, was was, in fact, governor of California when when Prop 13 was passed. But right. Like, so it's a... you're the governor. What can you do to affect a proposition? Sure. No, no. It, but but kind of wild to think that, like, you know, a very liberal governor after Reagan is is governor during the period. And maybe that was the voter base just trying to say, hey, we, we want to prevent you from raising property taxes on us. Right. Yeah. But that killed the golden goose. Yes. And well, not, 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 not the innovation part, but but in terms of the ability for the state to to actually benefit from the, the increase in the value of the land. Right. And, and your whole education policy in terms of like now you have to have state level funding for a lot of this stuff because they're, they're capped at a local level for the tax receipts and things like that. Right. I mean, like Texas relies on very high property tax, like Texas, you know, your property tax will just will just kill you <laughs> if you don't, you know, like if you if you just squat on land. And, like, and, and do that. no income tax. So so basically no the state tax. says, hey, the, the value of the state is being in the state. So we're going to 
we're going to make sure that you're paying your fair share or get productive use out of the land. Right. It does have, it does have a high sales tax though. Okay. That's um, but yeah. So then, so property tax and sales tax is how Texas makes its money. You know, that's pretty good. It's uh, you know, sales tax isn't progressive, right? I'm a, I'm a fan of, of progressive things being at the federal level. I think that having a strongly progressive, like federal income tax and stuff is, is the way to like tax the rich. Um, and then if you want to do tax at the state level, it should be broad based and about funding local services. You know, so so I'm I'm fine with the sales and property tax regime at the state level. State income tax doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense to me. I, I thought that the with the whole salt debate, which is kind of interesting, you know, all these democratic states like lost that and then they, they didn't add it back, right? So um but but part of me is like if you're gonna do something like salt, and so for those who don't know, it's like state and local tax deduction, the idea that prior to Trump, if you lived in California, you could just take whatever California was charging thirteen percent and then just write that off your federal taxes. So it's kind of a little bit of a transfer of not a little bit, a lot bit of transferring tax money that should be going to the federal government to to the states. It's just actually doing a, a, a standardized regime, right? So the idea is like if you you can do up to X percent salt. And then so any one of these states, even if they uh, don't want to have income tax, you you know, say 5% could be written off, then you can still have 0% taxes, assuming you're paying bettering federal taxes, and then that 5% can get kicked back to the state. Right. Yes. I know the killing salt is good. Like, um, <clears throat> there's no, you know, it's, it's, it's just a tax cut for the rich. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a federal, it's a transfer from the federal government to the states and you can get more of a transfer if you raise your state income tax. And at the same time, it's, uh, it's like a, um, it's a way of deducting taxes for the rich. So the rich pay fewer taxes. So, so Trump was absolutely right to, to stop this and states need to, um, uh, you know, what would be really interesting is to have salt just for property tax. That would be amazing because what that would do is say, okay, so if you tax your rich people by taxing their land, we'll give you a federal tax break. If you tax them by taxing their income, you don't get a federal tax break. So what do you do? You raise property tax, lower income tax. And then, because that's how you fund yourself. So you raise property tax, at the state level, lower the state income tax, and then now you're taxing land. That encourages development because what it means is that for any anyone who has property, you you have to develop the property, or you know, or you lose money. And so it's a it's a it's a Georgist measure. It's even better if you do the the official Georgist thing of exempting the structure itself. But the way you um the way you easily the the way you sort of backdoor the Georgist thing in there is to just have a standard property tax. And then give a um, a deduction for for development for construction. Basically, if you build something new, you know, um, then you then you get a tax deduction. And so then uh, of your high property tax. So if the federal government made salt just for property tax, um, I don't know if the Supreme Court would hold that up, but uh, assuming they did, that would be an amazing way of encouraging every state to build more stuff yeah and, and a stimulus basically it's just saying hey you now have an incentive to go hire a local construction plumber electrician i, I yeah. mean even you could you could argue it's like put a put a pizza oven in your backyard like just do anything to improve your property within reason it, it stimulates the economy and 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 actually a lot of blue collar work comes out of that yeah exactly california rich people would have an incentive to um to actually allow more property tax or people who have like income and, and property would have an incentive to do this. Um, yeah, yeah, they should do this. So, but, but like, it, no, uh, this is the thing I don't quite get is how, how hasn't the, the national progressive kind of where I think they, they tend to get a little bit more ideological because they don't have to worry about the local constituencies, you know, the Dean Preston problem. Why hasn't that gotten to the point where, um, from a virtue signaling standpoint, or just, you know, kind of moral mood affiliation, you, you have the AOCs of the world being like Yimby, like, and, and like you, if you're not building housing, you're racist privilege, wh wh whatever the right set of things to kind of out left the people at the local level, like why, why hasn't that become in vogue? Cause that yeah. to me feels like a very easy way to like Dean Preston now all of a sudden has to show that he's 
kowtowing to the intellectual elite within and within the progressive side of the Democratic well that is that is absolutely happening um so aoc has started saying a whole bunch of yimby stuff uh and you you can just just google aoc yimby and you'll see she 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 flipped from basically opposing new development to like encouraging new development um i don't know how important aoc is by herself you know she's this online celebrity but um but i do think you see this shift and it's just but but if you look at the democrats actual coalition what you see is that the people who run the democrats are are educated mostly white progressives right and those people um when you look at the structure of wealth in america you see that the the actually rich people have most of their money in stocks whether the stocks are their own companies or just the stock market itself and you see that the middle class and the upper middle class have most almost all their wealth in property especially in their own homes so education polarization means the educated professional class are all democrats right everyone who who has an advanced degree or or mo many of the people who have college degrees are those are the people who run the democrats and those people are either you know like an engineer google or an accountant somewhere or like a federal government worker blah blah, blah. anyone you can imagine with a college degree, college degree like a doctor or anyone so um those people their wealth is all in their houses and that means so so democrats are essentially a party of you know not not at the vote level but at the elite level that actually drives what the what the party thinks the engaged activist level because like poor people aren't very engaged they'll try not to vote for the party they think represents them but they won't be like engaged day to day as much and um this is, that's been a problem since forever but then but then the the educated upper middle class well-to-do progressives who run the democratic party and are its core constituency um they you know will like live in blue states and and you know pay state income tax so they want salt deduction and they have their wealth is all tied up in their houses that's where all their money went that's where they saved their money was in their houses and anything that seems to threaten their house values or threat even threaten the status quo in any way you know we think that like there has to be this chain of causality in people's minds well if they build this here my house value will go down it doesn't all you know is that your house has always gone up under the current thing and you don't want to you don't want to do anything to like change the way that land works in America because that might jeopardize this gravy train you've been on your whole life and your parents' whole life. That's why. But but you 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 sense a shift? I mean, like I, I would just say like the Noah Smith Twitter threads Mastodon graph that you follow, the the kind of like intellectuals on the progressive side of things. Do do you feel like a, a mood shift happening or? Well, I've, I've never used Mastodon uh, because unusable, but um, well, well, threads, threads in theory is going to integrate with Mastodon. <laughs> uh, yes, thread. I, I, I just stopped using threads because, like, if it's not on the web, I'm not going to use it. Um, yes, but, but your your Twitter graph, like, delicious. when you kind of are just looking at the feed, does it feel like it's moving more Yimby? Yes. I mean, obviously, you follow a bunch of like Yimby people, but in terms of like your mainstream elite progressives who are kind of setting the agenda. The New York Times editorial board, like, is is Yimby actually becoming a a, a major issue, or is this kind yes. of like lip service? But to your point, like the constituency, everything's tied in with their house, so they're not going to actually take action on it. The Yimbys are making progress, and uh, at the national level, it's been slower because everything happens first in California. And what you've seen is now you're seeing knowledge workers diffuse to smaller cities like Nashville or Bozeman or Madison, or wherever you want to talk about, right? Um, and to like sort of cities that weren't traditional knowledge hubs like Dallas, you're seeing um, people moving there. Um, and so what you're, what you're seeing with this is that now they're running into the same sort of problems uh, that California ran into, and they're, they're getting to Yimby faster than California did. California took years and years and years to get there. But nashville or you know or whatever bozeman is not going to take years to get there because the yimby idea already exists and is sort of this ready-made off-the-shelf thing that these people can use to understand the problems that are cropping up now that knowledge workers are moving in so uh you you really have um i think you're going to see yimby style stuff pop up everywhere my 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 friend who was you know the undergrad at, at umich when i was a grad student he became like the youngest city councilman ever in ann arbor he won a city council seat while he was still a college student and um, now he works for a nonprofit developer out here in california and he's like a total yimby 
And he said that it was impossible to get any EMB stuff passed while he was on the city council and quit and discussed because of this. But he said that now Ann Arbor is, is now EMBs are taking over Ann Arbor. And so um, there has been a shift. You can feel a shift. The, the housing problem got bad enough. And at the same time, sort of the Inflation Reduction Act, the climate movement and the, all this stuff and Bidenomics has put Democrats more in this idea of we must be the people that build things. And that's a nascent idea. It's just beginning. It's not dominant yet. You're going to see it become more dominant over the next 10 years, I think. I hope. Um, but it's still and, and the fact that you're seeing Ezra Klein get up there in The New York Times and say we need a, a liberalism that builds. He's going to win all those intellectual fights. I don't know what that means in the terms of on the ground organization or, or whatever, but he's going to win all the intellectual battles of that because so far the people who have come out against that have just flailed. No one's been able to, to yeah, I mean, rebut who, any of his core ideas. Who, who has the intellectual heft to be able to compete against, like, you know, as her or yourself or something on, on the progressive side of things? They're old boomers, right? They're like hippies. Right. Hippie boomers. And, um, you, you yeah. know, it's interesting. I, I, so I, I become friends with an architect here in Venice. And so I, he gives me a little bit of like the stuff that's happening. And so there's a California law and just a, just a small microcosm of this. So the coastal commission put in place to kind of keep the pristine California coast as kind of what the sixties, seventies, um, you know, environmental movement. Uh, one of the core tenets of that set of laws, um, is around public beach access. Hmm. So anything within a mile of the the coast has extreme parking requirements. And so it makes maybe more sense in Big Sur that you like want to allow people to be able to like park and get access to the beach. But when you're in Santa Monica or Venice or, or anything that, you know, San Francisco, everything is within a mile of the coast. The Coastal Commission now is a second layer of bureaucracy that sits across all land use permitting and, and um, parking is a big thing. And so so they're chipping away with at that. And, and so there's, I think, like a new law um that basically got passed at the end of last year where anything um that has two bus lines that as long as they intersect um with enough kind of uh v volume of, of the bus line that you actually get a pass on the parking requirements Ooh, and so now you nice. get like a half mile radius and so all of a sudden all over all these cities these these kind of like high transit points are going to be kind of the the ground zero for uh up leveled housing because now you don't have to go add you know, it used to be for every apartment, you had to have a parking spot or two parking spots or whatever is now you're gonna get a lot more mixed use and, and actually building up in addition to actually fast tracking it with some of the stuff that the state has kind of pushed where they, you know, that guy who got this, the, what was it by the exception in San Francisco for not having their, their, uh, you know, housing plan in place. He has the ability to go build that skyscraper in, in the sunset or whatever. But so, so yeah. I do feel like the laws in California are changing. It just, you know, this stuff takes time. Yes. Yes. You know why uh, you know why Japan is so built up? It's because why? the um, the train companies own the land around the stations. And so that trains in Japan lose money on their own, but they make money for the companies because they funnel people to shops near the stations. Oh, is that why like Shinjuku, like you go there and it's just like every single store and everything is right on the train station? Yes. Oh, okay, that makes sense. And and wasn't that the policy when they were doing the the transcontinental railroad? Is like the railroad companies got like alternating grids next to the tracks of land that they for developing the railroad. Obviously, there's a lot of corruption with that, but like basically the incentive was you get to develop the land yeah. for wherever you put the railroad. One man's corruption is another man's aligned incentives. <laughs> yeah. No well, I just feel like I always have to say that because it's like anytime you talk about anything that happened in the you know the 19th century in, in America, like, you know, we got a lot of shit done, but obviously there was a lot of corruption. So, like, uh, you know, you, if you're, you're kind of espousing that the 19th century was great, like you get accused of being, I don't know, racist or, or kind of like in favor of corruption. But I mean, we did we did know how to build at that point. I mean, it, it was pretty racist, <laughs> <laughs> but, the... was, but corruption isn't always as bad as people think. Just to close the loop on the NIMBY stuff, what is the intellectual justification they have? Um, obviously, it's, it's they're not just saying it's for their self-interest. They uh, mostly just screech a lot, but um, they claim that, I mean, their their claim, which is completely false, is that, that building new market rate housing uh, will, um, will draw a bunch of rich people to a neighborhood and, and gentrify it. Uh, 
this does not explain why they block 100% subsidized affordable housing everywhere. Um, it's, they're obviously full shit and lying, um, but, but that's what they say. They, you know, it's this, this gentrification argument. Um, there's no steel man of, of nimbyism other than to say, like, yes, America is a much higher crime place than Japan. And if you densify, then whoever lives near density is going to have to deal with that more than they would in Japan. And therefore, to a certain degree, effective policing and criminal justice systems that keep crime relatively low go hand in hand with density, which is why Grow SF has pivoted from, uh, um, you know, just pure housing thing to to more of a, a policing security focused thing. Because they know those go hand in hand. No, I would imagine, you know, this. Um, I feel like I read something and maybe it was from you talked about. Tokyo's land use policy is actually very influential or influenced by the federal government in Japan, though. So like the national government is actually kind of like encouraging the building and, and increase in sprawl of Tokyo um, and, and just kind of saying like, no, we are going to build housing. We are going to make sure that there is no equivalent of, you know, CEQA, NEPA, like all these kind of environmental regulations that allow people to abuse and, and delay projects. Is, is that is that the case or? Yes and no. So, so what Japan does basically a couple things. Number one, uh, Japan is national zoning and super simplified zoning. Japan tells you what you're not allowed to build in an area. America tells you what you are allowed to build in an area. Japan's way is better. Japan basically has this thing. I, I forget the actual name of this, but when you you basically take a, a, a area and you say, okay, you can't build anything that causes this much noise or releases pollutants or whatever. Otherwise, build whatever you want. So you get this mixed use uh, zoning. That's one good thing they do. Zoning is national, so it's very simple. Um, you just pick from like a few national types of zones. So your local, um, the, the national government sets what type of zones are allowed and the local government sets which parcels are which zones, are which type. But the national government says, here's six types of zoning, go. And then, um, and uh, so that's, that's very effective. The other thing Japan does is that if you want to build something, they have, Japan is very strict environmental laws, uh, in some ways stricter than America. But if you want to build something, a bureaucrat will check whether you fit the environmental laws and will check the boxes and we'll do this in a weekend and we'll say, okay, you're good to go, go. In America, the way you determine if people follow the environmental laws to have the developers start building then have a local NIMBY sue them in court, claiming that they have not filled out the NEPA or SICA um, procedural review. So whether or not they've checked all the boxes or not, doesn't matter. You sue them to say they haven't done the requisite procedure. They then go and take anywhere from months for you know lucky things to like years for the unlucky things. Uh, they then take that you know to, to go do these giant, famous, giant, famously giant binders full of review to show they haven't broken any law. And then the court, looks at it and says, okay, we looked through your giant binder. We think you haven't broken any law. So you may proceed years later. So that is a shitty system. Japan is the good system, which is they have bureaucrats check it. And what I wish, you know, conservatives or at least, you know, anyone who leans toward like the business or libertarian side of things, what I wish they'd understand is that bureaucrats are not always the enemy. Sometimes bureaucrats are, uh, you know, bad for things, but then, but there's this idea that bureaucrats always suck, you know, like, the the most frightening words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help, said Reagan. Well, he was wrong. You know, the most frightening words in the government are, you know, have you done your NEPA review yet? <laughs> That's those are the most frightening words. And so the bureaucrats in Japan will just there is some corruption with the bureaucrats in Japan. It's very minor. Um, but there is some. And but what the bureaucrats will do is they'll just they'll just look at your your plan and they'll say, okay, it checks this, it checks this, it checks this. They know all the laws, they know how to do this, they do a very high throughput of projects, and so they'll they'll do it very fast. It's like they do auto, environmental review on autopilot. They do it for everything, they're highly trained to do it. Um, it's not through the courts. In America, we do it through the courts and through lawsuits uh, to force you to do these giant procedures. And it's a terrible idea. No, maybe the way I would split the difference here with you is that I think if we empowered individual bureaucrats or, or kind of, it felt like there was an actual decision maker and a person you could sit across the table from, and, and then they were making the, the call versus I, I feel like generally when you interact, especially with local governments in, in kind of uh, dysfunctional places, 
you deal with like a procedural process to your point. And, and so even if we were to move it away from the courts, it, if it turns into this, no one, no one has responsibility because no one wants to actually take the potential blame for if, if it goes poorly and it's kind of, it turns into this institutionalized process. I think that's where probably the frustration would come. Whereas Maybe to the so. degree that you actually had a person, the call it uh, building, the building approver in that, that district. And they, it was actually one person and basically they kind of had to live and die by their decisions. I, I think that that would probably be a much better system. Right. But you know, living and dying by their decisions, the point is in Japan, all they have to do is, is check all the things they're not elected. They're not, you know, on the hook politically and they're not able, they're not able to exercise any discretion. There's no discretion of the bureaucrat that says you get to decide what gets built and what doesn't none. You, all you do, your job is to simply sit there and say, does it follow these laws? Does it follow those laws? You're, you're a computer. You're checking things. And so arguably um, we could have an AI do this at some point. At some point we will be able to have an AI do it, but it, hopefully it doesn't hallucinate environmental <laughs> violations, right? Um, let's get AI a bit better before we turn it over to that, because it'll be like, oh yeah, you violated this statute that I just made up. <laughs> anyway, but yes, so so it's not like you have a single accountable person that you can then kick out if they do a bad job. It's, it's bureaucratic. Yeah. So why isn't some little... progressive pushing this in California? So if we say things happen in California first, it's like, like, are we changing CEQA? Are we trying to move to this simplified zoning? Are we trying to remove the lawsuit as, as mechanism for enforcement on these environmental? Well, there's a big CEQA reform bill moving through the, the state legislature in California now. So the answer is yes. Why this is hard and why this took a long time has everything to do with the political coalition thing I was describing before. If you are a, you know, if you are a person from like an educated, like, you know, upper middle class family whose family does like real estate and professional jobs with the occasional engineer, uh, you know, though that fam, you know, someone from that background is going to want, you know, who owns a bunch of like residential real estate, they're going to say um, anything that changes anything that takes away my right to sue anything in my local neighborhood to stop it, I'm afraid of. That's the political coalition. It is what I call a stasis subsidy. It's the idea that we, instead of actually giving people stuff, we give people veto power over anything in the world changing around them. We say, you know, maybe we don't have effective government. We don't have, you know, and we don't even allow you to do like effective private sector things either. But what we do give you is the ability to veto any changes to the environment around you through things like Sika and NEPA lawsuits um, or various other complaints or local government control. And, and whatever we give you this veto. Did that book, Golden Gates, the one you recommended, talk about how that culture shift happened? Because I don't feel like prior to, you know, the 60s, that that was how things were done. Yes, that is the main subject of the book. Okay, this is this is, sounds like this book should be read and it, discussed this in this podcast. Read. It's really good. It also has a large section on the history of the Yimby movement in San Francisco, um, which, by the way, lost. The Yimbys in San Francisco lost badly, uh, whereas Yimbys at the state level are winning and in places in the East Bay are winning. It is in San Francisco where the Yimbys lost. So Grow SF is trying to succeed where the Yimbys failed because what Grow SF realized is that the Yimbys were getting voted down by Asian voters who were scared of crime. Hmm. So focus on what the voters care about rather than what you... Interesting. So It's almost as if democracy is a thing. Yeah. (laughs) I'd be curious, Noah, if you were to predict uh, 20 years from now, do you think San Francisco is, is a much more booming metropolis looking more like Hong Kong or Tokyo because the Yimbys have taken over? No, uh, but I think that it is, it will be, you know, modestly denser uh, place, but I think that the real boom will take place in the East and South Bay, which will start to look more like built up metropolises. I think that the area, the, the small cities south of San Francisco, uh, South San Francisco, the city, um, um, you know, Daly City, uh, Millbrae and all these places are going to be a lot more built up. Um, I think that people will recognize that as a distinct urban center and they do not right now. Uh, but so, in, in 20 years, they will. So there'll be kind of like an amalgamation of like Daly City is it's like a Brooklyn versus Manhattan. Maybe they don't have the same mayor, but the reality is like living in Daly City would be like I didn't know a single person in the 10 years I was in SF who was kind of like a young, educated, working as a software engineer or something living in Daly City. Right. Like that, right. even though you arguably 
living in some places in SF with poor public transit to get to work in Soma compared to being close to the Daly City BART would have been a much easier commute. Right. That whole area between the official boundaries of San Francisco and the airport is that is the future of San Francisco. And then in the East Bay, you'll have just any any East Bay community has the opportunity for growth. Like and, Oakland and why do you think San Francisco economy. won't won't increase? Is it just that these white boomers who have the houses are just going to stick around for another 20 years and not? That's possible. But I also think um, I mean, I think. Uh, uh, I think there will be some modest densification, but honestly, San Francisco is already quite a dense city as American cities go. Uh, it is this tiny little like thumbnail of of you know of land, and um, we could Manhattanize it, but one of the um, but the the transit links are not enough. So urban fragmentation really hurts transit, right? Because you can't get the cities to agree on the trains to build between the cities. Everyone fights because they think, oh, no, poor people are going to take the train to my neighborhood and, and beat me up and steal my stuff. And um, and so you get the Marin's uh, blocking of BART. Yes, Back that's exactly day. right. Yeah. That is what it was. Also, San Jose's blocking of BART. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so you get that and you're going to continue to get that. Um, there is San Francisco will be able to do some, but turning San Francisco into Manhattan is actually only a marginal gain in terms of density taking all the like places with single family and turning them into um, turning them into Brooklyn type of places is a much bigger gain. Yeah. I think that that uh, there will be, there will be a lot of that. We will legalize it at the state level and the small cities will then have to like build more stuff and people will realize that you can live in, in South San Francisco and it's great. Um, South San Francisco is like, this is the greatest, this is the best kept secret in San Francisco. All the best restaurants in San Francisco are, are like to actually, in in the area in the immediate area are actually just to the south of the city there's like great and mostly asian food actually and in fact it's it's mostly asian people moving to these cities so so it is actually interesting you mentioned that i so the last place i lived in sf for you know the last few years was potrero hill and mm -hmm. so naturally spent more time in the dog patch and then you kind of start to wiggle your way down to bayview and like just the general area there um pretty gritty in some areas for uh san francisco and crocker amazon and but but you quickly realize like that that side of the hills in san francisco a as better weather right it's, it's actually starting to feel like south bay so it's, it's warmer um and it's a lot of industrial stuff which to me seems crazy it's like a it's like a prior era when san francisco had real industry and shipbuilding and whatever it's like okay like that you know there's like a lowe's right there it's like probably not a good use of uh like push push that out of the city and actually i think increase the density of housing or rezone um becomes a pretty appealing thing right and so I, I that's an interesting frame to think of like basically everything south of of the the kind of like core hills of san francisco as you head towards the airport it's a pretty big chunk of space that could start to get a lot of density it is and that's that's the future of San Francisco itself. And in terms of the Bay Area, you also have San Jose and the areas around San Jose. And then you have sort of this like sprawly, far flung, like Oakland uh, peripheral towns. And so that that's the future. Not really Marin, I think. Yeah, no, no, no Marin. It's all, all owned by malt. Yeah. We've been talking about housing and, um, and I want to spend a couple minutes on um, on crime. Uh, you Mark had the provocative claim on Joe Rogan's podcast that um, the crime that we accept in San Francisco is is a choice and um, we're making kind of a deliberate choice. I, I think the implication there is because we're not tough enough on, on crime, we are making a choice to accept it. And, uh, you know, a, extreme example is, is El Salvador, um, but they they have made a different choice and they're seeing a different different outcome. And, and we, too, could make a different choice, but that would perhaps involve a um, much tougher view and, and a less flattering view of, of human nature. And so I'm curious if you think there's some truth to that claim, Noah, that, um, you know, we're sort of making a choice and um, to accept this, this level of crime. And if we made a different choice, we know that we would have, um, you know, a much better situation as it relates to crime. Well, the answer is yes, of course, it's a choice. But uh, the question is, who is making the choice and why? And saying we doesn't answer the main important question. Because I will give you some different people who could be making a choice. 
So the mayor saying we won't, you know, go after people who steal less than nine hundred dollars is making a choice. Uh, the DA is ma makes choices of who to prosecute. The police commission makes choices about police policies to approve. The police themselves make a choice about whether to work or not. The voters make a choice about whether to, you know, reelect uh, or to elect people who will replace the police commission or or whatever, or just, you know, um, if if it's a police strike, if police just don't want to don't want to work, well, why not? And what do we do about it? Uh, I'm not talking about an official strike by the union. Uh, I'm talking about a slowdown where police just say, like, I'm not going to arrest people because I don't feel like it because I don't feel appreciated in the city or there's donuts to be eaten somewhere. There's a donut with my name on it. I don't know. And so what do you do in that case? Well, you can defund the police. Um, you can fire and replace the police like they did in Camden, New Jersey. You can enact a police commission to try to ride herd on them. What do you do? Like, who will guard the guardians? So if, if, if it is a police strike, a police slowdown, what do you do? Who makes that choice? Besides just individual police officers deciding to just screw around and do nothing. We don't know. There's a lot of questions I don't know. Gary Tan and Sachin Agarwal will claim to me that it is the police commission that is holding the police back from doing their jobs. Other people I know will claim that it's a police strike and show me statistics on declining arrest rates. Other people blame the mayor because I think it's easy to blame the mayor. And the Board of Supervisors has a role, has a, a very important role here, too. Um, who's making this choice? What else could we do? One very robust finding is the Pareto principle in crime. So when you hear about most of these crimes, it's being it, it's ma massive repeat offenders. The way the what you do is you you take those people who are like massive repeat offenders and you jail them for very long times. Uh, you remove them from society. But doing this may save you from having to jail very large numbers of people or do like massive broken windows policing or basically that that's broken windows policing that's another thing you can do so the question is are we okay with sending a few people you know people who like commit you know five robberies are we okay and and you know get arrested five times are we willing to send that person to jail for 20 years for 40 years just remove them goodbye you're out of society and that's one question the other question is broken windows policing are we are we willing to have a cop on every corner checking to see if you look shady that's sort of the other, you know, thing you can do. Uh, increasing penalties uh, does not exert a deterrent effect on criminals at all. It's basically just through removal. Um, but having lots of cops around does exert a deterrent effect. If you know there's a high likelihood that you'll get caught, even if it's just slap on the wrist for doing some small infraction, that is a deterrent. No one likes having that happen. So, um, so those are sort of the two things you can do. Uh, El Salvador, of course, did the first one, but just, then just massive. They took everyone who was in like a gang and put them in prison for the, for life. They just they they concentration camped all the gang or the gang members, and uh, and that worked. Um, I don't think America is prepared for any solution of that sort. But um, the two things you can do are like the cop on every corner, broken windows policing strategy, which New York has done. And you can do the, uh, you know, the old three strikes approach of like, you know, if you're obviously just an incorrigible repeat offender, then goodbye. Eric, because we've brought this up multiple times, and I think people know that I tend to be a little bit more conservative. Like, I don't think the El Salvador approach is at all viable. Like, fine if it works in that country. Like, yes. I, don't, I don't actually have a real strong opinion on El Salvador. But like, it doesn't work in the United States. We have due process. Like, we have a constitution, Bill of Rights. Like, like let's, I think it's like a, it's like a fantasy world of like even thinking that it would be. I, I think to Noah's point, it's the the those two things. It's one, what is our tolerance in society for putting people into, whether you call it a prison or an institution or something where they probably don't want to be there, but we've decided collectively, this is the, the threshold by which you can't integrate with society, whether that's someone who's mentally ill or cr criminal or whatever. Right. And I think, I think it's definitely been a shift and I, I always like to cite the book, The New Jim Crow, because it feels like that was the the vanguard in terms of intellectual circles of, can you believe how many people are you know incarcerated right. for these these cannabis offenses? Wh which came out just as incarceration was plummeting like a rock. Yeah, and 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 so you know, like poorly timed book. Sorry, Michelle. But 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 well written that, book. Yeah, yeah. So so like w we have to have that conversation, and I actually don't think like. People, people will then want to be like, well, this type of person, even though they're they're probably not functional within our society based on the norms of whether it's mental illness or or following the law, 
the reason that they're there is because of systemic what like you know start going off into that that that's a conversation people should have but we should actually be having that conversation and i don't think anyone's having that i think that the police on every corner this becomes actually in some ways it's like a cost thing like i actually just police are expensive and and see new york and and then there's also the component of like no one really wants even if you're a law-abiding citizen no one loves having the police around kind of right. like literal police state and so i i think that like those two conversations aren't being had people just yell at each other for all these other things but like those are those are the practical solutions to to solve for this issue Absolutely. yeah when, when i say el salvador all i'm referring to is the idea that being tough on crime even within our u.s context um is effective because I think that that's or could be effective because I think a position for a long time is that it's actually counterproductive and doesn't solve the the the, the root problem. But but to that point though, so how how do you actually have that? Like let, let's try to play like how do you get a strong, you know, on crime stance in California? So you could have a strong mayor, TA, police commission. We're we're doing that, but they're state level criminal laws like you don't get to decide like how the the sentencing guidelines like san francisco can't put you in state prison based on its interpretation like it can do some amount of that but like ultimately it you'd have to change the state legislature and and the governor in, in so that's a much bigger problem to go change than just san francisco based policy i mean san francisco definitely could do a lot better stuff tactically on on the ground and you know the especially the police on every corner type broken windows policing probably won't have as many car break-ins but in terms of you know should we be taking fentanyl dealers and putting them away for life that 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 actually needs to change at the state and and federal level although i think the federal laws are are still pretty pretty strict on that yeah to close the loop on this topic dan what do you think are the highest leverage changes or recommendations you would make to help improve things in in san francisco or, or california at large like what is your 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 platform or what, what opportunity do, do do you see do you want like tactical things that you could actually go do or do like structurally changes so that it would actually be well run into the future give us B- both. both give us both okay so i think the tactical i think michelle tandler's point of view of like I, i'm convinced on this is we need more temporary shelters so that we can actually use the laws on the books to take people out of the streets from the tents and actually put them. New York City has this, right? Like it's like build like places that people can actually be housed overnight. And I think you start to solve a lot of the the like tenderloin issue. Um, I also think like my my personal view is that there should be zero tolerance for a guy on the corner who's who's selling fentanyl. Like I don't think it's like rocket science to figure out who, who who's doing that. Um, so I, I think the fentanyl stuff needs to, to go, the meth stuff needs to go. And, and I think the housing, I think the long-term structural change though, is that, uh, cities in my view should be run by mayors. Like they, like one unitary executive, some amount of check from, uh, like an equivalent of a legislature. But the reality is the check is going to come from the state, right? Like the state can actually come in and say, Hey, you're not doing this. Most of the laws are from the state. So having a mayor that can actually make the decisions and is accountable for those decisions right now with San Francisco, it's like, who's accountable that, that that's the issue. And so it's like, you can, you can blame London breed, but like, and I'm not even like that big of a London breed fan, but like, it's clearly the board of supervisors. Like, how do we get rid of Dean Preston? And then to Noah's point, it's like, you start to get into these like weird gerrymander districts or like, just like strong power bases with idiosyncratic politics. Like that's a really tough problem. So good for Gary. And I think we should have him on the podcast to like really understand tactically, how are they changing these in San Francisco? Right. What, what about, you know, how would you change things? Well, I mean, uh, in terms of, of structural changes, I would, I would definitely make the mayor more powerful. Uh, people elected to citywide office in San Francisco are consistently more sane than the board of supervisors itself. I would, uh, you know, have, have checks on the use on the outsourcing of government services to nonprofits. The nonprofit industrial complex is a big problem. I would have um, improved oversight of police such that, you know, you can, you can fire police who don't do their jobs, uh, but also so you can, you can directly control, you know, how much the police arrest people for this and that, you know. Um, I don't exactly know how to do that because I don't really understand how the police commission works, but um, I would, of course, you know, make it much easier to build housing. That's sort of a no brainer. And also I would set up regional, stronger regional transit authorities that can, you know, sort of preempt local policies to build trains 
uh, links between cities, which makes it easier for people to get into the city from other cities and will create a race to the top uh, rather than race to the bottom for Peel Prop 13. Um, and then, uh, you know, improvements to zoning codes uh, such that you have very like, you know, more Japan style zoning. Uh, that's kind of a kind of a no brainer. And um, yeah, I think those are some of the basic changes I would make. Yeah, I, I'd agree with no on the like, I, I think of that as a state policy. It's like the biggest issue for the state should be focused on housing. And 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 to be fair, they are doing it like that. AB, yeah. you know, two nine two zero nine seven, the one I was talking about for the transit, like creating the parking requirements, like chipping away at these these laws and, and CEQA, especially the, the California environmental law and, and, and streamlining it so that that people who want to build housing and improve the land in California and increase density should should kind of have the right to go do that. And it should be a very rare exception where they get blocked. Yep. Agreed. The maybe gearing towards the the last topic here. Um, Oppenheimer, uh, you've been you've been tweeting about it this uh, this weekend. No, of course, it's the the film has opened conversations about the legacy of of Oppenheimer, some some questions around, um, you know, sort of World War Two, um, kind of the broad the broader um, the broader conversation. Where do you think uh, misconceptions are, are abounding, Noah? Or where do you want to sort of correct the record or, or add some nuance to the, the conversations that you're, you're seeing play out? Well, first of all, I haven't seen Oppenheimer. I don't like Christopher Nolan movies. And I'm considering just never seeing it. Um, <laughs> three hours of Christopher Nolan is a little much. I didn't even like Inception or The Dark Knight or whatever. Also, Oppenheimer, like, I'm not that interested in him as a figure. I know about his life, but he's not that interesting, ultimately. If you wanted to make a biopic about a physicist, you should have made one about Feynman. He's so much more interesting. There's also, there's other people a lot, like Fermi, I don't know. There's a lot of people more interesting than Oppenheimer. He's just not like, the reason you make a movie about Oppenheimer is just to make a movie about the nuclear bomb. So we just make a movie about the nuclear bomb. I don't care about this guy and his like stupid dating life. You know, like, I understand it's kind of amusing that, that physicists of that era were all gigantic players. Actually, they kind of still are. If you know any physicists, you'll know they uh, they get around. But um, but uh, yeah, like that's kind of amusing. And it's, you know, the time period. But oh God, I'm just not interested. In it. But OK, World War Two, though, we were, the you know, to say we were the good guys doesn't mean we were good guys in World War Two. We did a lot of bad stuff in World War Two um, and, and the Depression. But, um, dur you know, during the Depression, FDR deported a million Mexicans and Mexican Americans, or sorry, 2.5 million Mexicans and Mexican Americans. So people with citizenship, who cares? Go to Mexico. You look like a Mexican, go. Uh, many of those people were allowed to come back later, but um, but that was just like complete like ethnic expulsion. They they did it because they wanted to preserve jobs for like white people. That was bad. Um, that was a bad thing to do. And um you know, of course, the Japanese internment uh, was bad, and we did all these bad things. We allied with Joseph Stalin. You know, <laughs> we, what? Like that was bad. Uh, and a lot of the things we did to to Japan, the bombing campaigns were were excessively brutal. I think it didn't really ultimately help. Like firebombing Tokyo didn't really help end the war, um, even more than the nukes. The nukes actually did help end the war, but the the firebombing of Tokyo did not. That was just us being a dick, and uh, Curtis LeMay being being overly savage. But like, um, but you know, when the world goes to hell and truly scary people start tromping across the world, conquering whole regions of the globe and turning them into living nightmares, you've got to stop them. And you don't go to war with the allies and coalitions that you wish you had. You go to war with the allies and coalitions that you do have. War like that is always an exercise in the lesser of two evils. And I think in World War II, we did we played that game extremely well. Um, the world became a much, much, much better place as a result of our what we did in World War II, not just the actual winning of the war, but the building of the coalitions, the emphasizing of the human rights, the institutionalizing of like the United Nations, drawing the Soviet Union into the global power structure and institutionalizing it instead of having it be this pariah rebel state. Um, all these things that we did were extremely stabilizing and, and they contributed to the fact that the Cold War never went hot. Someone was going to figure out how to make a nuclear bomb. Japan had a nuclear program that had a correct design, uh, but no funding. Germany had a nuclear bomb program that had funding, but a bad design. Um, and so they didn't make nuclear bombs. We did. Uh, someone would have made nuclear bombs. It's a thing that you can do. And 
had we not won World War II and not just won, but participated in the very active way that we did and you know, made ourselves important for the ultimate victory, somewhat very bad people would have ruled the world and had nuclear bombs. And the period that we now look back on as the Cold War would have been a whole bunch of very, very bad hot wars. Um, without the, you know, we're the ones who pushed, we, you know, decolonization was essentially a condition of us helping Britain and France, uh, you know, in that war. Like you had to give up your colonies afterwards. Um, and so that was, we did decolonization. We, we were the good guys in as much as you can have good guys in a real life story. Ultimately, we did, we, you know, in, in the stories, the good guys win while doing everything right and not murdering anybody and not breaking any laws and always making the correct moral decision at every juncture. We did not, because in reality, to be a very powerful and effective good guy, you can't be good and moral at every juncture. You're going to have to make compromises and do dirty things for the overall greater good. Um, and, and very few of the stories we tell recognize this fact sufficiently. I think maybe we're starting to, or maybe, maybe not like you can see it in game of Thrones. Uh, you know, some of these gritty dark tales begin to scratch the surface of all the nasty things people have to do in real life to bring about good outcomes. But we did bring about good outcomes in world war two. And it's, it's very good that we overall did what we did. How's that? I mean, I think that's great in the sense that it's extremely nuanced and like to say that the U S isn't the good guys is, is a, just kind of bait in terms of not 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 that you're saying that but in terms of characterizing your opinion there hmm. um i'll write a blog post on that yeah i i think that one thing i would say though um and this is always a little dangerous in terms of just relative comparisons but if you take like scale of one to ten bad things that were done in world war ii or or even just kind of take the 30s in in addition um, or even go back to basically the beginning of World War One. So to take that entire kind of two war period for all of the countries involved, Germany, 9.5, 10 out of 10. I mean, it's basically as bad as it gets. Japan is right there with everything that they did in China. What is the U.S.? A three, a four? You know, probably the Brits maybe worse with some of the the starvation that happened in India and, and some of the stuff in their colonies. Right. We were the least. Uh, I mean, bad obviously, the Stalin, uh, like Ukraine famine, like that's a pretty big, big number too. So, like, I, I feel like in terms of on a relative basis, yes, everyone did bad stuff, but uh, I don't think we're even close to, right. to some of the other folks. We were the there. least bad power involved in that war. Democracy is the least worst version of the government, and the U.S. was the least bad in terms of. Uh, so, therefore, we were the good. We were the le right. We were the we were the least bad, and then if you that that's why the the you know current emphasis on finding bad things America did and condemning America because of that has no perspective. Ultimately, this comes from a fundamental anti-Americanism, a belief that America is great Satan, which is not true, and which is pushed by people who would rather bring in a a, a bigger Satan. No, it sounds like you're a conservative. Are, are any conservatives saying this anymore? I mean, like, look at who's look at who's, you know, talking about like the U.S. is evil in Ukraine. We should just get out and let Putin have his sphere of influence. Look at those people. Who are those people? Are those I mean, there's a few socialists saying that Noam Chomsky says that. But like by and by, that's mostly right wingers. Horseshoe theory. They just get Horseshoe. so extreme. It comes all the way back around. Exactly. And so if you look at like the people denouncing our military, like our military is trying to like have a large recruiting base and, you know, all the the, the kids like are not white uh like the, the the percentage of white kids went way down if you if you don't count hispanics as white and um uh but non-hispanic whites went way down so we need to have this diverse recruiting pool so the military's trying in its clumsy bureaucratic military way to to you know increase its its relevance to address the recruiting crisis um and like and then the the conservatives are all saying oh no it's woke military blah blah, blah. and and really they're just you know a lot of these guys were hoping that the military would have sided with like a Trump coup and blah, blah, blah. And they didn't. And they're mad about that. But that's that's in their decision framework somewhere. But like, honestly, like if I if you're a pro like if you're pro America and you think America is basically good, uh, a good force in the world and that people should like America and kind of be patriotic. Like, don't tell me there's a home for you on the right these days. This is not 1984. Or whenever Reagan, this is not Reagan time. 
Like this is not when you can fly a flag and say America and then you are conservative. Like if you fly and flag and say America, you now you're now you're neither a conservative nor a, a progressive. Like where another like, topic for another time. Progressive patriotism will come back and it is already coming back, but it is not completely back yet. So anyway. Maybe the last question. Um, no, you're also a big fan of Japan. Where do you think people misunderstand about Japan or don't fully appreciate uh, either about it today or, or its history? Or, well, that, or what do people get wrong? That's a topic for an entire podcast episode. But I will say that okay. the biggest canard about Japan, the biggest. Um, so so Japan is much less closed to immigration and, and foreigners, or whatever, than it used to be. And people just do not know this. And so they just assume it's like the 80s. Uh, and, and then you can't get to Japan, but you actually can now. I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go sponsor myself for a visa and move there because you can. It's really easy. Permanently? Uh, oh, semi-permanently. You know me. Bi-coastal, right? Um, Tokyo? Or? Uh, probably Tokyo, yeah. It's not my favorite city. It's, it's... If, if you had to do a non-Tokyo city in Japan, what would it be? Osaka or Fukuoka. Those cities are are great actually any city i mean go sapporo sapporo I, I i went to kanazawa one time when i was yeah. there and I, it was amazing it's amazing yeah like get out of tokyo people i don't know but like so many of my friends are there it's you know tokyo is the international city it's like the new york you know where it's not necessarily the best city in america uh, but it's the biggest city and tokyo is like the same for japan but the other thing people really misunderstand about japan is they think the culture is very conformist i would say that in general the thing Americans think of as conformity, which is people look to other people and try to imitate them, or their social norms about don't stand out. That's what we think of conformity, and that in Japan is not very common. Uh, America, Americans are more conformist in terms of looking around at the people next to them and trying to not stand out from them. And like the nail that gets up will be hammered down is more true in America than in Japan. What Japan is more is a rule following society. So Japan is based on rules and scripts to follow. So like if you if you work at a cafe, there'll be like a, this long script of every exact thing that you have to say. And there's like social rules for like when exactly you should give what kind of present to whom and blah, blah. So there's a million rules in Japan, but people don't look at their neighbor and try to say, well, my neighbor, you know. So when I was a kid, uh, I was made fun of for not wearing Nike Airs, right? You can imagine like early 90s, right? Nike Airs were the cool shoes. And you know, I didn't, I wore, I don't know, Reeboks or whatever was cheap because we didn't have much money. So like, uh, I wore Reebok or whatever. People are like, what? You're not wearing Nike Airs? I remember this dude, you know, this dude is like, you're not wearing Nike Airs? What are you, nerd? You fucking nerd. That guy's a math professor now, by the way. But anyway, uh, I, I still keep in touch with that guy. He's a math professor. But he made fun of me when I was in like fifth grade for not wearing Nike Airs. And I was like, mom, please get me some Nike Airs. I need to be cool. And I was like 11, 12. But then I, I finally got my Nike Airs and they were, you know, stupid. They were terrible shoes. Anyway, um, but the point is that I told the story to people in Japan and they laughed at me. They did not believe I was telling them the truth. They said, wait, if you didn't wear the same shoe as someone else, you would be made fun of. You'd be bullied for not wearing the same shoe as someone else. I was like, yes, that is real. And they were like, America's crazy. And so that's that's what people don't understand about Japan. They think everyone in Japan would want to wear the same shoes as everybody else. Absolutely not. In Japan, like people don't even have the same political opinions, right? I, I remember asking my friend uh, in in I think this is two thousand six or seven uh, when I moved to Japan the first time. Um, I remember asking her, "Do you think abortion should be legal?" And she's like, mm, "No." Hmm. Actually, you know, yes. <laughs> And so that blew my mind. She had never thought about it before that moment because no one had ever talked to her about it. She had never argued with someone about it. There, there was never any enforcement of the kind of political conformity where you talk to your friends and your friends, if they don't like what you're saying, like, yikes. And then if they do like what you're saying, like, ah, good, I'll invite you back to my dinner parties. None of that. No, no one talked about it. So, so the idea that Japan is conformist there are structures in Japan that enforce something, you know, some sort of so social regularity. There are rules that people follow a lot. It's a very rule oriented society, but in terms of the imitative conformity and the socially enforced imitation that we think of as conformity in America is much less common in Japan. How about that? And it's a good tee up for a, a deep dive on Japan at a future future episode. I want to be uh, mindful of uh, of time here. Noah, this was a great conversation on uh, San Francisco, California, um, and um, on some other topics as well. Thanks so much for joining uh, Moment of Zen.
Thank you so much for having me on. Good to see you now.